Welcome back to the Changing Earth podcast with author Sarah F. Hathaway and co-host Chen Gibson. Blending survival fiction and fact to bring you entertaining education that will help you dream, survive, and thrive. And now, here's your host, Sarah F. Hathaway and Chen Gibson. Chapter 39. You found her in a hole? Dolores asked, looking over the young, white-haired girl while classical music played in the background. She won't talk. Or maybe she can't, Monroe explained, standing behind her. The major doesn't know what to do with her. Doesn't make sense to hand her over to the refugee system. How do you know her parents are gone if she won't talk, Dolores wondered, grabbing a cloth napkin, dipping it in water, and gently wiping the girl's face. Just because she can't talk doesn't mean she can't respond, Monroe countered. What's your name, honey? Dolores asked the girl pointedly. The young girl's pale blue eyes looked up and she whispered, Alexis? Pleased with the response, Dolores declared. See, she can talk, Tim. Isn't that right, Alexis? Smiling slightly at Dolores' encouragement, Alexis answered meekly, Yes, ma'am. Do you want to get cleaned up? Dolores asked, softly brushing her greasy white hair behind the girl's ear. Yes, the girl replied. Tim, you make sure Virgis and his fighters keep taking that iodine. None of you should have been that far south for that long. You know the radiation down there is worse, Dolores scolded. Yes, ma'am, we know. Who would have thought it would rain that much? Monroe defended. Shaking her head in disgust at their stupidity, Dolores replied. You're lucky you found shelter. Looking fondly at Alexis, Dolores added, and this beautiful little girl. Come on, Alexis. Dolores left into her private back rooms, and Monroe returned to the table in Dolores's downstairs sitting room. Where's the girl? Chappie wondered. Dolores took her to get cleaned up, Monroe answered. Let's go upstairs then, Chappie declared, rising from his chair. The men climbed the wooden stairs and sealed up the secret door at the top. The music thumped loudly and Chappie could feel his stomach growling as he smelt the food cooking in the kitchen. Sitting down at one of the tables, they waited for a woman to come and take their order. Chappie looked at Monroe curiously. Something's been on my mind. What's that? Monroe wondered. I thought they shut that nuclear plant down in Southern California long ago. How was the radiation so bad? Chappie wondered. They were storing the used nuclear rods there still. The cooling system must have failed, and the radiation was released, Monroe explained. Makes sense, he said, thinking about Monroe's answer. I guess. A woman in a tight, dark purple dress approached. Her brown, wavy hair flowed over her shoulders where the spaghetti straps held the dress in place. You boys want a drink? Yes, ma'am, and a couple burgers as well, please, Monroe answered. As the waitress walked away, Chappie watched Cole walk by. Don't look now, but it looks like Miss Cassidy is in town. At least Virgis might be in a better mood, Monroe suggested. Or not, Chappie declared, watching Virgis scowl as Cassidy approached him. To what do I owe the pleasure of a visit from Miss Cassidy Baker, he wondered. He loved seeing her, but it was so complicated that Cole thought it was best to avoid her. I'm not allowed to swing by and visit my favorite baby face, she asked. Her brown eyes sparked mischievously. He looked at her skeptically. You know you're always welcome, but it's been a while. It has. Can we go somewhere to talk? After everything I've heard about your new base, I'm eager to see it, she told him. Come on, Cole stated, rising from his chair and heading out the door. Exiting Dolores' place, they headed into the mercenary base. Sir, Jessup greeted him as he opened the gate. Good evening, Private, Cole said officially, quickly ushering Cassidy in. She looked around, admiring his operational readiness and infrastructure. You've been busy. People want their lives back. All you need is to provide some stability, and the rest falls into line, Cole declared proudly. Cassidy chuckled softly at him, following him into the command building and up the stairs to his office. Very nice office, Major, Cassidy declared, looking around. His office was simple, with a desk and a small bar with liquors. There was a small seating area, and through another door was his bedroom. Thanks, it's coming along, Cole declared, heading over to pour them drinks. Glad things are going good for you, Cassidy stated as she approached, 
taking the glass from him. How's your dad? Cole inquired, heading to the chair in the sitting area. He's good, working too hard, Cassidy declared, sitting next to him. Cole looked at her crossly. How is he, really? Cassidy took a long drink. He's been having a hard time with his high blood pressure. Is that why he didn't come himself? Cassidy smiled. No, he didn't want anyone to see him with you. Cole smiled coyly at her. Is that the only reason, he wondered flirtatiously? No, she replied, pausing. I wanted to come. I feel like I owe you a thank you. You took the position. You've been relaying valuable information and we, she paused again. I really appreciate it. When the day comes that our country stabilizes, we have to be able to reclaim freedom for all, he told her coldly. Cassidy laughed at him. The adoption program may end that dream. How will people return to freedom after they become second-class citizens? We've done it before, Cole insisted. Anyway, the adoption program didn't make them second-class. The FEMA camps did that. Now it will be made official, permanent, Cassidy countered passionately. There has to be an order, Cassidy. We can recover, then restore, Cole exclaimed calmly. We'll agree to disagree about that. We can never return to what we were. The question is, where will we go? Cassidy asked, looking curiously at him for answers. That is the million dollar question. But I know one thing for sure. Desperate people don't care who they hurt to feed their families. That problem has to be our primary focus, Cole responded dryly. Cassidy looked at him intently, standing up to pour another drink. When did you drink the Kool-Aid? She asked as she watched the caramel color liquid fill the glass. When people I tried to help robbed us during the middle of the night, turning a whole community into refugees, Cole snapped, putting his empty glass on the table. Cassidy came over and filled his glass while she countered. The feds did that, Virgis. When they decided Arizona was non-essential and shifted the resources that should have gone there elsewhere. My dad was there in the courtroom, trying to fight. They knew the wave was coming, and they did nothing. No one even told you. They were doing national triage, Cole answered flatly. That's bullshit, Cassidy snapped. They've shifted all the resources towards the Capitol in Kansas. They're going to make sure they survive. We'll be able to change it again, Cassidy. For now, we have to do what we have to do to maintain order, Cole assured her. Cassidy shook her head at him knowing he would come up with a cold response to whatever she had to say. She looked at him and said bluntly, I need more fighters, Virgis. Cole's eyes narrowed before he rolled them at her. I knew you were here after something. Thank you indeed. She reached over, grabbing his hand. Oh, stop. You know I'm sincere. I just need fighters as well. And how do you suppose we facilitate that without anyone knowing or getting hurt, he wondered. I was hoping that's where your expertise would be applicable, she told him coyly. He looked at her and smiled. My expertise, huh? You know you're lucky you're so darn cute. I think you had me wrapped around your finger from the moment you said, My name is Miss Cassidy Baker. Her cheeks blushed a bright red as she countered. Don't change the subject, Cole, and don't get me wrong. I like you, and we've had some good times. But the years have been hard, and this is going to be a long fight. I just don't feel the timing is right to be sharing those kinds of feelings. I get it. I don't want to change what we have any more than you do. You keep being cute, fighting your fight, and I'll see what I can do about getting you some extra hands, he told her, standing up and gently brushing her hair behind her ear. Thanks for understanding, Virgis. You're the best, she praised him pulling him to his feet and kissing him on the cheek. He laughed, putting an arm around her and hugging her into himself. Why do I feel like such a sucker then? She kissed him passionately. You're just lonely. Come on, we can fix that. Then you'll be gone and I'll be lonely again, Cole countered. That's a problem for tomorrow, she told him, leading him into his room. Hello and welcome back to the Changing Earth podcast. This is episode number 437, season 15, episode 
39. Hey, Chin, what's up? Hey, Chin's up, y'all. So, um, oh, and, and joining us today, we have Ellen with us. Hi, Ellen. How you doing? Hey, good day, y'all. So I wanted to do a little uh, public service announcement this morning because a friend of mine I was telling you guys made me realize, like, how many shows I have put together and how long you guys have been out there listening. And I just really, really appreciate um, the opportunity to bring really great information to you each week and uh, spend time and uh, do the podcast. So thank you listeners for being here because I uh, really appreciate you guys. Both of my guests today, my co-host and my guests are both because of my podcast as well. So uh, I guess that's just like living testimony right there. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you guys. Appreciate it. Come oh, with yes, me. Stuff. Yeah, come with me on my journey. It's so great. Yeah, first time Ellen is coming out, she's like, hey, I'd love to meet you. There's there's a hotel. Where's the closest hotel? I'm like, hotel, dude. I live way far <laughs> away from a hotel, man. So I uh, had an extra room. Come on. Oh, no, you were sleeping in the loft even, right? I just had the loft. Yeah, it was in the, um, yeah, uh, yeah, the new house, yeah. Yeah, the cabin. I was like, oh, I got a bed, man. <laughs> So uh, okay, I would I, I would have been happy with a couch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, very cool. It just was a nice little reminder for me of how special the journey's been. So I want to thank everyone. All right, um, yeah. audio drama. The uh, episode thirteen is live, sounding great. James, I I just I really loved his performance this year. I'm gonna give out my little Emmys at the end of the year, maybe. <laughs> and, <laughs> Because this is just good stuff. Um, he did a great job. So that one's live. Episode 14 is live for subscribers. Over at the members area, that one is commercial free. So if you'd like to get access a week early, you can go over there and become a sub subscribing member. I do have the whole playlist up on YouTube now. So please head over to YouTube. I'm at Changing Earth Series. Give a like, give a subscribe, and you can follow all the podcasts on YouTube now, which I think is a pretty cool um, little feature that YouTube did. Also, um, they do play in the background. So if you like to listen while you're doing other stuff, it's a really nice player. It plays in the background, and you can just uh, keep it going whenever you're cleaning or working or... Doing whatever you do. Um, next on the list, gardening season. I've been kicking my butt. My friend Carrie's like, did you get your garden in yet? You know, it's coming early here in Texas this year. Like, oh, man. So this week it's on. Uh, Southerners, get on that. Northerners, I've, I would like to think you guys still have a little bit longer to go, but it's been pretty warm up there this year. So my dad said, like, Michigan was in the 70s. Um, this week, so crazy times. And then Prepper Camp 2024. I heard there's still spots available in Tent City right now. I don't know about the rest of the campground, but um, I think there's still spots available in Tent City. I heard somebody just the other day said they got one, so get your tickets. Don't forget a place to stay. And you guys will be here for Prepper Camp. Well, I we'll be there. Wait. Can't uh, wait. Right? It's going to be fun. Bombing in the van. <laughs> <laughs> Both of my cars just are going. Make, just don't make that concoction we made last time. That was, uh, that was wild. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, we went in a little overboard last year, so it was like, Woo, pump those brakes. <laughs> oh, you need to bring out some of the uh, some of the good Australian rum. Yes, that's always on the cards. Yes, as long as we don't drink it all before we get there. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, so this week we heard Virgis chapter 39. Uh, last week, he found Alexis in the Radiation Zone, had a really cool show with Dave Jones. So if you missed that one, head on back, check that out. Uh, Dave, 
always just a wealth of knowledge. Plus, we had the little bonus where he gave us some wonderful information on how to identify a fake police officer, which is really cool as well. So, yeah, last week's episode, definitely worth going back and checking out if you missed it. Uh, but this week, Virgis's team, they go back to Reno. Cassidy shows up. Well, little fun time for Virgis. Always an argument. Always a mixed bag of tricks with that girl, I'd say. Um, and so today I wanted to talk about how long realistically society would stay civil once the food supply starts severely dwindling. Um, I would argue that it is right now, like with the rate of inflation and everything, everybody's more strapped. If you're not, wow, you're living in a cool bubble. Wish it was one I was living in. (laughs) Oh yeah. The little carts. You know, a little tiny cart at the grocery store, 130 bucks, like six items, you know. How's it looking over there in Australia, Ellen? Bought a box of cookies, like at the deli, you know, like the pre-done cookies. Uh-huh. And there were 10 instead of 12 in the box. Those clear plastic box. <laughs> yep. There's 10 instead of 12. We went to barbecue the other night. It was $19 a plate. Oh, I know. It's just... Wow. Yeah. So, how is it looking here? Um, yeah. It, it's pretty deep. Um, we were just, I've been really focused on it the last, or seen I've been off work the last six weeks and because and, we've been a bit strapped to cash for a bit. Um, and, yeah, it's like I just noticed things jumping like a dollar. Right. The week. Yeah, just a, a whole dollar. Uh, a packet of, a packet, a big packet of chips, the chips, uh, uh um, like potato chips that I like, they've uh-huh. gone up to like $8 a bag where they were like $4 like last year. Um, that, uh, that's what we've been noticing. Um, the thing that, Really, um, at the moment is that there's a CO2 shortage in Australia. Um, so <laughs> all the cup drinks have not been available, like soda oh. water. There is still heaps of Coke and Pepsi, but all the cheaper ones, um, have not been available. And I drink a lot of soda water. Um, I haven't been able to get any. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. So there's a CO2 shortage. Um, which is affecting the carbonated drinks. I thought um, Australia was making plenty of CO2. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, yeah it's just capturing it. <laughs> Crazy. Um, yeah, and what else? Like, I haven't uh, heard of that shortage yet. That is, that's pretty, yeah. that's pretty unique. And I'm, not just uh, people food, animal food as well. Yes. So, um, my German chef Dasha, his his food's gone up five dollars a bag. Yeah, that's uh, one thing we noticed as well. Brock came home, he's like, the bag of dog foods up to like sixty bucks a bag, and we're yeah. not buying like we don't. I mean, I there was a time when I bought him the really good food that was expensive, but I haven't been able to afford that for a while, you know. So I'm not buying them like the bottom of the barrel stuff. But still, that was crazy. It used to be just forty bucks, or you know, thirty-eight dollars somewhere in there. Yeah, and and with that, um, yeah, the cat food, cat food's gone up. Um, mm-hmm. Just the 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 cat litter that's gone up five dollars oh. a bag. Uh, yeah, just random things that I've just noticed. It's like, hang on a minute. Ooh. What? <laughs> like, what? Yeah, like now I'm spending yeah. half of my money on just buying them food and litter. Yeah. Crazy. Yep. Um, you just, yeah, just like that. And there's been holes in the shelves, not, not as bad as it was, it had, was in COVID, but, um, there's just been holes in certain things. The pasta is starting, starting to dwindle a little bit. Um, what else? What have I, what else have I noticed? I um, think so- that any kind of fluctuation is going to hit way harder when you have, only, you know, a handful of companies that have now taken over everything. And um, so if their company, so to speak, falls short, you're going to see that instantly. As opposed to when we had a lot of competition in the game, then somebody else could step up and fill that gap when there was a problem. 
So they've done a, a fair bit of a bit of background searching and stuff like that because we've got two major supermarket chains in Australia, Woolworths and Coles. Then you've got Audi and the small independent ones, stuff like that. Audi is sort of taking a little bit of competition away, but the drivers for everything um, is Woolworths and Coles. And they have just – both those companies had – billion dollar profits last year in the financial year but our food is going up and we're like it, the, even the government now is starting to say hang on a minute <laughs> we need uh, we need more competition in australia because they are just taking mm-hmm. yeah just reaping yeah absolutely from us. so we majority shop from audi now um which is not supporting australian business because they're german owned but they're they're uh, like a same amount of my trolley size from, or cart, we call them over there, um, from Audi will be double the price at Woolworths. Yeah. That's what we shop at um, for the grocery store. We go to Aldi's now. It, yeah. It's really much better pricing than yeah. grocery, the normal grocery stores here in town. Hmm, and interesting. Because do- it's like a half hour drive for me to get to the Aldi's here. So, <laughs> what it used to be for us, well, everything's a half an hour now, but in yeah. when I'm to Charleston, it was, you know, a drive. It was like 40 minutes to get to Aldi, so we never really shopped there. Yeah. But it's, it's just as close as any other grocery store, and it's good pricing. Interesting. And they don't really fluctuate too much, is what I've seen with their prices. So, it, it it's not like a dollar jump, it could be like a 20 cent jump. Um, with gotcha. uh, with products, um, yeah, but yeah, we've we've. Uh, I, I'm lucky enough. I've I've got an Audi within five minute drive. So, so that really leaves me like going. Okay, so then we've already got we've already seen the situation. It's probably not going to improve itself anytime soon. So how long? When do things start cracking? Right is what I'm always kind of curious about. So I found this cool article, uh, Five Steps to Famine by the World Food Program. So you know that's going to be good. Um, and it was interesting, though. So like step one was food security. Everybody's got, you know, access to sufficient, safe um, and nutritious food, meets their dietary needs. They really base this off of 2,100 calories per day. Like can the majority of people eat over 2,100 calories per day? So less than 5% are ne- malnourished and people have stable income. So that, you know, is a good, good portion of the first well, world, right? One, 2,100 calories per day. You can rack that up in like two handfuls of crap, you know, chips or something. You know what I mean? Right, right. It's- Good calories or is it this? This is safe, you know, sufficient, nutritious. You've got all um, access to all the food groups, right? So you're Mm. able to get nutritious food. Think of how much of like this inner cities, though, are like those food dead zones. So I'd be really interested to see, you know, um, less than 5% of people are malnourished in the in these countries. So, and people have stable income. So, I would I don't know. I I'm uh I'd be interested to see numbers of what it actually looks like. Cuz I would think that would actually gather up a good portion of countries. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, definitely more and more. Yeah. Um I, are, I mean people- like countries falling short on that. Yeah. Yeah. Right? in it here right that's what i'm saying like you go down to you know <laughs> downtown san francisco um inner city chicago um I, I would throw detroit in there they've been doing a good job of trying to bring back like local foods and stuff like that to provide that nutrition um level so uh, that's interesting okay so number two Food insecurity. So this is phase two. Trouble meeting needs have to make significant changes to meet non-food needs. So this is like flooding hit, you know, natural disaster type event, or we have social um, 
unrest, you know, um, warring nations, that kind of thing. Unsustainable incomes, 5 to 10% of those people are malnourished, on, only 2,100 calories a day. So they're just barely meeting these needs, but they, most people, you know, 90% of them are able to meet those needs every day. It's interesting to, uh, see, like you said, the 2,100 calories can just be gathered up so easily. So that's a pretty low, low mark, I would say, but that's what they're going off of. Okay. And then you have three acute food insecurity. So most people can only meet their needs by selling essential possessions. Others using up essential resources to support a very limited diet. So this is like food has gotten so expensive, you know, we can't afford to pay to buy it without starting to sell some of our possessions, that kind of thing. Um, limited food choices, extreme lengths um, to get required calories, 10 to 15 people, uh, 15 percent are malnourished. So this is they experience some serious income interruptions. So I definitely wouldn't put the U the U.S. in that category um, at this time. I would say most everybody could could get at least access to something, right? Mm -hmm. We haven't experienced like massive flooding, but there's definitely areas that are like this um, in Africa and whatnot. And so then we go on to the humanitarian emergency. People facing extreme food shortages, hunger-related deaths, increased rapidly, irreversible loss of income, 15 to 30 percent malnourished, access to three or fewer food groups. So this is where, you know, you're starting to limit out. I only have access to rice and this other thing. Um, and that's what we live off of. Taking in less than 2,100 calories a day. And then famine. Is number five, complete lack of access to food and basic needs. Two in 10,000 people die of starvation or disease. 30% plus are malnourished, total income loss, only have access to one or two food groups, groups extreme calorie shortages. 20% of families face extreme shortages. So at what level there do people get really, really pissed off, you know, before before they're going to die of not being able to eat enough. So there's stories from Roman times about emperors that would, you know, purposefully detain the food supply to make people more malleable, right? But that can be the ultimate blow up in your face as well. So what are your thoughts? What level do you think? Um, I think just with the current situation, People are angry, but they're not to the point that they're angry that they'll, I mean, yeah, it's it's like, it seems like it's getting closer and closer to the edge. Mm -hmm. We're going to blow over, it blow up and, and start um, really um, protesting, stuff like that. There is, there is uh, more reliance on food banks and stuff like that right mm -hmm. now. Yeah, huge um, call for it huge call for it just in here as well um people can't i uh, haven't been able to afford to fill up their cars with with gas um and not be able to get to work and all that all this stuff um so i think, I think it's i think it's like number three at the acute level when it's like yeah you know the, you can only meet your food needs by sacrificing other essential resources to do that yeah giving up people are giving up their pets right that sort of stuff yeah. yeah like it's it's i'd say you know second level third level yeah because once you get to five i think you're you're it's like too late pretty much you're like almost it's almost like it's too far gone once you get to the famine level so yeah i mean that's we're talking uh, Great Depression, stuff like that. Okay. Um, so what do people do when food runs out besides get really, really angry? You you called it right off the bat, Chin. Number one is eat lower quality food. Mm -hmm. So you buy the, the cheap stuff, the, 
like if you're going to feed your dogs the cheap food instead of the expensive food because that's all you can afford to feed them, you know? Afford, yeah. Yeah. So when you start making those kind of decisions, um, you know that things are legit. Um, it, it's interesting to study history on food as well because um, a lot of the competition to make national brands and um, then worldwide brands also drove the prices of food way down because there was so much competition for a time. And so while that was all happening, people got used to a much smaller percentage of their income actually going to food because of the time that we were experiencing. So you have to wonder if that's coming into play at all either, but how much of that is being artificially manipulated because you only have the few companies left doing it so they can artificially manipulate it to be whatever they want it to be rather than you have all that competition in the market. Um, and then the private public partnerships, you know, that the government start to have with these companies, then it really limits out competition. So it's an interesting, uh, space of history to be in, like most of our lives these days. I mean, I the thing I like to think of it this way when it gets too expensive to make your own bread and it's cheaper to buy a, pre a, a ma mass produced one. That's <laughs> that's the right? point that point now. Yes, you know, like yeast, your your you, you yeast, your flour, and all that sort of stuff to buy all that. You can just go get a dollar loaf of bread off the shelf, which has got heaps of sugar in it, all that sort of stuff, mass produced stuff. Well, that's um, uh, we have a pizza company. I'm not going to call them out, but we have a pizza company here in the U.S. And they're like, oh, you can get two pizzas, two things of twisty breadsticks, and a thing of Coke. All for 20 bucks, right? And it's like, that is just, it's a one topping pizza, right? So you've got bread, 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 bread and cheese and meat, and then bread and cheese and something else, right? So basically, it's just a box of bread for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, who's living off that? Take your family out, what, you know, three, a family of three or four. Oh. And see what that runs you. Oh, yeah. You go to a sit down. Well, that's what I said, even for barbecue the other night. I mean, when we first moved here, it was $12 a plate. Now, mm -hmm. four years later, you know, it's $20 a plate. Just because their costs have increased so significantly. Everything, you know, everything that they use. Was it good, though? Oh, it's freaking bomb, dude. It just <laughs> melts in your mouth. It's so good. Yeah. It's just you, it's fewer and farther, you know? Um, Watch that, uh, then. <laughs> up at Brisket Love. Didn't I take I thought I, we took you up there to Brisket Love. No, we didn't, we didn't go. Oh, man. Okay. Well, next trip. All right. So then you nailed the next one. Number two, turn to neighbors, friends, family. Turn to community. Um, just, you know, but if the community's struggling, they can't help. So right now we're able to still do that. Um, that's also like the number one preparedness person fear, right? Is when things start running out, then they're like, oh, well, you still got some. Why don't you share? Well, you had the opportunity to get ready as well, you know? Yeah. So. Uh, but that is actually, yeah, like second step of what people do. Turn to their neighbors, friends, family. Can you, you know, can you help me eat? Of course. Of course, you know. Number three, we talked about this one too, the hunting, foraging for wild foods. But this is unreliable source and it's often energy intensive, right? So you could go walk all day and you don't get anything. And so that was just wasted calories. That's location. I mean, you're not going to go hunting in Central Park, so. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. For, like, pigeons? I, I mean, here, I I can snag a deer whenever I want, but um, when when I was in Charleston, like, I couldn't really shoot something out the townhouse window. Right. Yeah, and, like, people go, you know, you can forage your greens, too, but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, I've got a I've got a pond just down just by uh, the back of my house. I've already counted how many ducks are there, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, and, and then uh, yeah, we've got a because you can't 
you, you well, you can, but you it's really restricted. You can't shoot native animals here, like kangaroos and stuff like that. But if the if it came like that, I'm like looking around that my neighbourhood going, yep, there's I know where that big mob of kangaroos are. <laughs> Um, some nice looking steers down the road and all that sort of stuff. It's like, yep, I've I've worked it out. <laughs> the kangaroos are just slowly diminish one by one. The ducks will be gone in the first week. Well, and that's <laughs> that. Like the hunting statistic is interesting. Oh, this might have been in the green room we were talking about that. Um, that more people are hunting now and uh, than ever before to help supplement. So even just as, you know, as like we say, we turn up the water, right? The slow boil. So you start depleting all those natural resources before like the major event even hits. Um, that's going to leave you more screwed for later on, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. So number four on the list kind of goes along with this harvest immature crops. So people will actually pull their food earlier. And instead of letting it go to like full fruition. And so it lowers the overall amount that they're harvesting out of their crops and it reduces the nutritional value of their crops because they didn't let it go all the way to fruition. So I thought that was you, pretty interesting. And then it diminishes if it's able to re-sow and get the seeds and re-sow that to be able to have a continuous crop. Right. Right. That's- that could be livestock too. I mean, you might harvest livestock uh, before it's fully grown, so you, you're not getting as much meat. Right, and that could have been like, a, that one could have produced a couple times before you slaughtered it, you know, so that could also hurt with future, um, yeah, future animals. So yeah, I didn't really think about that one, but you totally would. If you were hungry and you knew your potatoes were just about there, uh, you were going to pull them so you can eat, you know? Okay, and then yep. um, eating seeds. So people start eating their seeds, which I talk about a lot. You can eat sprouts. They're great protein and all that. But you don't get the full harvest from that. Plus, you don't have seed stock to plant for next year. Yeah. Got to have lots of seeds. More seeds. More seeds needed. <laughs> They've gotten expensive, too. I can yeah. Eat- I just um because we're going in the winter now I'll um I'll get everything at the start of winter and then I, it prepares me for the for, for going the spring. into spring. Yeah, just yep. to, like restock my seed supply because I have like two years back, so it's always rotating, right? Yeah, it, it's getting and more I, and more I, expensive. eBay for me, it just people just um randomly selling seeds on eBay. People got their little own little businesses and they collect their seeds, and it's like oh, oh I, I, good point. My stuff is from. Yeah. 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 Garden Girl says start saving seeds from what you can. Yeah. I've been doing a lot of those experiments. I'm like, oh, okay, let's let this one go so we can seed it out. Absolutely. Okay. Eating whatever is available, even if it isn't food. So in one country, they have mud cookies and this is literally dirt mixed with salt, fat and water. And they eat these mud cookies, like when they don't have enough food, they eat mud cookies, which is crazy. And then one lady was talking about, you know, um, when they're, when they don't have any food around and whatnot, they're eating old hides and skins, which, you know, I've, I've heard of that because like Donner, the Donner party, um, learning those stories and things. Uh, where they were boiling leather to eat that, you know, so it makes sense. I put that in my book as well. Um, so yeah. How'd you like some mud cookies? Mm. Mm-hmm. Sounds delicious. <laughs> Doesn't it? Yeah, hi. Be very, very gritty. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay, limiting portion sizes at mealtime. Mm-hmm. Honestly, we've already uh, started doing that. Yeah, I have to do that anyway. I have to lose weight, so I'm already doing it. <laughs> Fair enough, but like because you can't, or there's less, right? When you buy something, yeah. there's less of it now. Oh, hundred percent. So, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Everything's um, more packages. Right. Costs more yeah. money. The steaks, steak sizes, for example, um, they're, they're like virtually half. So when you're talking about livestock. The I the the steak and even the chicken the chicken is smaller than what it used to be. 
just chicken pieces, like chicken wings, uh-huh. um, billets, all that sort of stuff. It's all smaller than what it used to be. Interesting. Like so less in the package? Still- or physically yeah, smaller? Just, just physically smaller. Huh. Mm-hmm. So they, they're pumping out more chickens. Yeah. In and they don't have to time. grow them as long, so they don't have to yeah. feed them as long. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The early harvest. So, yeah. So yeah. the chicken breast size is literally in, halved <sighs> in the last. You can still find chicken pieces that are, are quite, you know, l- large stuff, but the majority of the stuff that you get in supermarkets, it's it's smaller than it used to be. Mm-hmm. Honestly, like, I quit uh, eating a lot of uh, store-bought chicken a while ago because, yeah. like, there was this, like, really rubberiness that yeah. I started noticing in chicken, right? And, like, if you don't soak it or whatever first, and I think that it's because they're not leaving them to hang long enough before they're frozen. I think it's rigor mortis, honestly, because I did that. I killed a chicken, ate it straight away, and it was rubbery as all get go. And that's because we didn't allow time for it to relax and let the rigor mortis go away. Yeah, uh, you have to let him sit in the kitchen in the fridge for a couple of days. Yeah, a couple of days, right? So I don't know. Like the only thing that's the only way I've been able to naturally produce what I'm experiencing. A lot of times when I buy chicken or I make sure I buy a whole chicken, um, something with the bone on because the breasts just seem like they were just so rubbery. Uh, it was just disgusting. I don't know what was going on with it. So we quit eating a lot of chicken because of that and switched over to just eating a lot more pork. Honestly, we do like pork stir fries and stuff. Yeah. But pork is, uh, has remained pretty stable here in Australia. So we've been eating, a, a, um, a fair bit of pork as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but chicken, even chicken wings, used to be the cheapest apart from the, the, the giblets and all that sort of stuff. The chicken wings used to be the cheapest part of the chicken. You could get it for $5, not even that, no, $3 a kilo. Now they're $8 a kilo for chicken wings. Everybody loves those chicken wings. <laughs> yeah. Like, Fried chicken wings. <laughs> and then. It, oh, um, for chicken breast, it's like sixteen dollars a kilo, seventeen dollars a kilo for chicken breast, and um, yeah, it's, it, as you said, it's cheaper, cheaper to just get the whole chicken. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that's what yeah. I've been doing. I mean, and then I can feed parts of my dogs and all that stuff. So, okay, yeah. um, number eight on the list: skipping meals all together. So going, you know, day without uh, without food all together. Um, women are actually more likely to do this. They'll skip full days. Um, this can really lead to health issues. It can have serious consequences in children leading to malnutrition and stunting and then also vitamin deficiencies and stuff like that. So um, it's bad when people start skipping meals altogether. Number nine. Um, oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, just with that. I, I've heard, I've had differing, I've done differing research in that. Um well, if you're doing planned fasting, that's different than I don't yeah. have enough food to actually yeah. eat today, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And probably uh, if you're doing planned fasting, you're much more nutritious meals when you're eating. If, right, yeah. If, if you're the yeah. mom that's skipping a meal because she's trying to make sure the whole family had had enough to yeah. eat, then, I mean, they're probably not having good nutrition to start. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, mm-hmm. All yeah, right. Because I'm doing, I'm skipping breakfast. So, um, all right. Um, intrepid commander just joined us in the in the chat room. I don't know like, what that strange accent was? Is that Ellen? <laughs> 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 um, selling livestock. So, Chin, you were talking about this one. So, if people just start selling their livestock, so they can get immediate benefit to buy all their different foods and whatnot, then. And it caught- because it costs so much for feed. If I mean, if, if you if whatever you're raising mm-hmm. can't forage for its own meal, and you have to go buy feed, yep, the feed is ridiculous. Well, that's one reason why I love like raising my own chickens because you know you can do meal farms, you can do um, lentil growing and things like that, and actually use a pretty small space to be able to keep them fed. So that's going to be my focus of expansion um, here on this property, right? Because uh, 
I, you know, just space wise, it works. But yeah, sell too many of them. You don't have long term food. You don't have long term income. Uh, traveling, breaking up the family or moving away. So migrant labor situations, you know, can't, you got to go find work where you can so you can feed the family. Um, they're traveling long distances for, to forage or some countries that's an excuse for marrying off, uh, their young daughters. So they have less mouths to feed. <laughs> uh huh. That was one of the things. Um, oh, this, I guess I should note, this is all coming from concernusa.org. So, um, but I thought it had some great tips in here. And then, um, migrate the whole family. So we have lots of refugees on the move right now. Um, and a lot of them are food reasons. If you knew like, oh my gosh, if I could just go live over there, we're going to be well fed. We're going to be able to raise our family and happiness and whatnot. Or I'm going to stay here where we're going to starve. Well, gee, you know, by all means, you pick up and go. And then my last little bit was on like, okay, so when does it reach a tipping point that we have war because people are hungry, right? So ironically enough, war drives hunger. And hunger drives war. So it's a vicious circle, right? You go to war and that can create severe supply shortages like we're having right now because of the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Um, I won't give any opinions on how I feel about it, but the simple fact is that we are having um, food supply disruptions because of that conflict, which is going to cause people in other areas to go hungry because their supply chains have now been cut. They estimate that more people died of hunger during World War II than in the actual battles because of the conflict and people not being able to get resources that they had previously. Yeah, I mean, England brought in the Russian, uh, the war ration um, thing during World War II. People were people were living off a little ration per right? day, food, even and um, victory gardens and all that sort of stuff resulted from that. Correct. Yeah, which is ironic now that they're like, oh, it's not green to grow your own food. What? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, many contributors to war, but hunger is all often the one that breaks that straw that people are like, nah, we're done. We're going to war. We want to eat, you know. Um, whether that gets the job done or not, I don't know. But when people are hungry, your brain just isn't working correctly. Uh, food riots result from, you know, remove the food. You got food riots. And then poor governance often leads to food shortages, which causes people to question their faith in their leadership and can also and often cause rebellion against leadership. Um, so it was interesting, you know, without reflecting on our current world that like back in the day, the Caesars were like, yeah, we're going to cause food shortages to get control over people, which often backfired on them pretty severely. So, um, interesting that humans would be so, uh, so eager to repeat the past. Cause they don't learn from it. Right. Yeah. It's just not a good way to go. People hungry and dying is not usually a good thing. So, and if people aren't, they don't have the um. Even, and now I'm just trying to learn, you know, preserving and all that sort of stuff. All all that knowledge is gone because if this whole generation has relied on just going to the supermarket to get their stuff, right. and now like having to learn how to can and, and stuff all that again. I'm learning well, it from scratch. And we I had never... the conversation too about the bread, right? When you can when yeah. you can buy the bread cheaper than you can make the bread, then that doesn't make sense. Well it's the same way, like uh for example, yeah. peas, right? It takes so much work and everything to make that can of peas that you go and buy at the store for well, now it's like I don't know, a buck twenty five, thirty five. But it used to be like 99 cents, you know? Yeah. So it just didn't make any sense to do it yourself when you could go and just buy it so much cheaper, except for the fact of you know what's in that food and it's more nutritionally yeah. sound. Well, most people wouldn't even know how to shell a pea, so. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. 
it takes so many. I had this like huge bag of peas, right? And I was so yeah. excited, and that equaled one pint of peas. <laughs> oh, it was the worst. Talk about a kick in the guts. I'm like, okay, I'm never going to yell at my kids for eating the peas in the garden again. We only grow those for eating while we're gardening now. <laughs> <laughs> just, just graze, send them out to graze. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yep. That's the best part. Alrighty, any last thoughts before we jump into the changing earth news? Nah, it's don't like, don't like where it's headed, but we, we shall see. It's just more reason to understand we need to be prepared. Like they're talking about putting vaccinations of food. That's a whole nother conversation, um, but that they can actually do it. So it's just another reason to think about having yourself prepared, your community prepared. Knowing how to grow, you know, a basic crop that can feed you and then some other goodies that you like to graze on when you're outside, you know, and uh, just more of a reason to get into it and stay with it. Because if you don't practice now, you certainly don't want to be learning when your life depends on that, you know, a little bit that you can actually produce for yourself. So stay on it, folks. Stay on it. I need my own encouragement. (laughs) Gotta get my garden in. All right, here we go with the Changing Earth News. All right, Changing Earth News. So we had a huge plasma eruption off of our sun this morning. Um, Not that it's going to hit the Earth, but it was beautiful to see. It was really cool. And if it was aimed at Earth, it would be big problems for us. But uh, the Lord has protected us again. It was on the incoming limb. So if you get to go, uh, go check out Suspicious Observers. You get to see it there. And uh, it's really cool. It just lit up the coronal graph. So um, if, you have, if you've never seen it, go check it out. It's fun to watch. Okay, on the 4th of March. March already. This year seems like it's flying by. I'm just going to say. We're going to be at Prepper Camp before you know it. Um. March 4th, we had 443 earthquakes that were 2.0 or bigger, biggest of which was a 5.4 in the Indian Ocean in Indonesia. There was a um, 6.7 south of Australia. They downgraded that to a 5.4. It was out in the ocean by the Macquarie Islands, or no, 5.8. Did you hear about that? No, I didn't didn't hear about that. You know, uh, it lit up because it's over by the not too and all that stuff. Am I? Yeah. So that that one happened just south of you. Um, La Cumbra volcano in Ecuador had a volcanic eruption on the fourth. There was some really bad flooding in Pakistan, triggering landslides. 30 people, unfortunately, lost their lives in that storm. It also kicked up a very ro- rare tornado. It hit. Jehulam. Um, it did some massive damage over there, and there was record setting winds that took out power in Las Vegas. On the 5th of March, there was 458 earthquakes that were 2.0 or bigger, biggest of which was of that 5.8 in the Macquarie Islands, just south of Australia. Um, in Utah, thousands of tumbleweeds invaded this little town and people couldn't even open up their door because there were so many tumbleweeds that had blown in. So that's always fun to see. Those things are a mess to deal with. On March 6th, there was 436 earthquakes that were 2.0 or bigger, biggest of which was a 5.1 in the Aru Sea by Indonesia. There was a 5.4 earthquake in China. Um, Atlanta, Georgia had massive flooding causing road clo- closures. Uh, Northwestern Brazil is still still dealing with a lot of flooding over there. Approximately 100,000 people have been affected by that flooding. 12,000 people have been displaced by it. Bolivia is also being affected by that same flooding um, series that's going on there. And on Talia or Turkey, they were hit by a tornado Basically, everything just disappeared in two minutes. It was a severe storm and uh, really scary to watch. 
On March 7th of 2024, there was 431 earthquakes that were 2.0 or bigger, biggest of which was a 5.7 in the North Pacific Ocean near Costa Rica. And then on the 8th, there was 382 earthquakes that were 2.0 or bigger, biggest of which was a 6.0 in the Philippines. So if you guys are watching the pattern, we didn't have a very big solar week last week. It was still pretty chill this week, um, minus the event that happened today. So we're not seeing the uptick of earthquake activity. Oman was struck by a series of flash floods. Um, the EU put February 2024 as their hottest year in rec or hottest February on record was 2024. So you know that the, the climate advocates were all up over that one. Um, March 9th of 2024, there was 397 earthquakes that were 2.0 or bigger, biggest of which was a 5.5 in the South Pacific Ocean near Fiji. There was a 3.5 earthquake in Northern California and then that 3.6 uh, in Sydney, Australia. And you said it was uh, up north, northwestern? Uh, west. Okay. In the mountain. In the mountain. Yeah. So, yeah, the Blue Mountains sort of uh, it, like, and Sydney is sort of like, uh, not ca it's it's called the Great Dividing Range. It go it divides the eastern seaboard up from the basically central um, areas of Queensland. So uh, not as Island. unusual yeah. to have events up there. Um, well, it is unusual because we very rarely get earthquakes. So it, but it wasn't actually in Sydney. Got yeah. you. Okay. Um, Charleston, South Carolina, they had a flooding event over there. Um, that was because of their high tides, lots of rain coming down. So they um, saw some vehicles, homes, and businesses flooded. Brantley County, Georgia, dozens of homes destroyed by a possible tornado event just yesterday. It usually takes them a couple of days to confirm that it was a touchdown of a tornado, um, but they got a lot of damaged homes over there. Um, March 10th, that's today of 2024, there's 382 earthquakes that are 2.0 or bigger so far, biggest of which so far is a 5.2 in the Solomon Sea by Papua New Guinea. There was a pretty good flooding event in New Jersey that was causing road closures. And then um, Indonesia, man, you know, I was telling Brock today, if you want to live someplace where like you, you um, experience a wide variety of natural disasters on a weekly basis, I think Indonesia definitely takes the cake. Um, Western Sumatra had another flooding event landslides it killed 19 people at least there was still seven missing i've seen those numbers pushed up now as far as like 30 so prayers to everybody um over there that's a, that's be you know in the middle of that event um there was also a major flooding event in dubai today as far as volcanoes there are 27 volcanoes actively erupting on our planet right now that's up one from last week there's 19 showing minor activity that's holding steady and our unrest number has gone down by one i think it just pushed up into the erupting level uh as far as u.s wildfires we have 15 new fires 17 current fires for a total of 1 million 436,000 acres on fire 20 of those fires are contained. Texas is still topping the list at number one with three fires burning, two new fires, 1,237,000 acres on fire with three of those fires contained. Uh, we did get a good rain event over here in northwestern Texas, so hopefully they got some of that up in the panhandle. Um, Oklahoma is number two on the list. They're in the same fire event that Texas is. They have um, one new fire... Or, or I'm sorry, one fire, seven new for a total of 119,000 acres. Six of those fires are contained, so they're doing a good job of getting containment um, under wraps. And then Nebraska still coming in third place, only one fire burning, total of 69,810 acres, and that fire is not contained at this time. Alrighty, guys. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Um, thank you for listening to the show. Remember to go over to my YouTube channel. Give a like and subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. Um, but I appreciate you guys coming on every week, coming to listen. 
Um, I'm tickled silly. I just kind of had a revelation today of like, wow, it's been a long time. So a lot of episodes. <laughs> my sons can go back and like see my whole life if they wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Well, it just kind of hit me today. Alrighty. Well, thank you for coming, Ellen. Always a pleasure. Can't wait to have you back here uh, in the States because I have so many new toys for you to play with when you get here. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> right? Wow. It'll be so good. I mean, enjoy my time. Yes. Yeah. Because goodness knows it's too precious. All right. Until next time, remember, dream. Survive. Survive. Thank you for joining Sarah and Chen for this episode of the Changing Earth Podcast. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Day After Disaster, Without Land, The Walls of Freedom, Battle for the South, Dark Days in Denver, and The Endless Night at www.authorsarahfhathaway.com. If you love the Changing Earth series and podcast, become a supporter while you're there.